Hey, what's up? I'm Brian Goulet of GouletPens.com, and it's episode 41 of Goulet q and I'm here flying solo today. Rachel's not joining me this time, but you know, that's okay. I can hold my own. We got a pretty busy day. We're doing a lot of interviews this week. We're still growing, still expanding here at Goulet, and it's kind of crazy. So I'm having to like kind of squeeze in Q&A today. Um, we have a pretty involved interview process here. We're interviewing um, some people for our customer care team, which is a very important role for the way we do things here. So got to really take a lot of time to do it. Um, and so I'm an integral part of that. And so I have to kind of squeeze in Q&A, but that's okay. I got some good questions. I got way more questions that I could possibly hope to answer for this week. So I'm gonna have to kind of talk a little fast and I'm gonna have to cut out most of the questions that I got. So don't be offended, please, especially this week, if I didn't get to your question, I apologize. And you'll notice I do have some marks on my arm. Yes, I did wreck my bike last week, as I did talk about. I was all bandaged up like some kind of, you know, um, hospital, you know, person. Uh, but no, I'm okay, healing well, everything's doing well. Um, so uh, for this week, uh, I'm pretty much, gosh, I think I'm just gonna pretty much dive right in. So let's get right to it. Uh, first question I have is from Vivian S on Ink Nouveau. I'm not a physically strong person, so having to take apart a pen is really tough for me. I always feel like I might break the pen because I find myself applying as much force as I can. Any tips on how to loosen pen parts, such as a nib and feed, piston filler, etc., to make it easier on myself to assemble and disassemble the pen? Thanks. Um, okay, so it's gonna depend a lot on the type of pen that you have. So you definitely want to make sure that you're doing as much research as you can ahead of time on the specific pen that you're looking to take apart because some pens really kind of aren't made to be taken apart without special tools and things like that. So it could be that the reason you're struggling with it is because you're trying to get the pen to do something that it's not meant to do and you could actually cause damage to the pen if you try too hard. So it's gonna really depend on the pen that you're doing. But if it's something like, you know, Noodler's Ahab or Conrad or something where you know the nib and feed is supposed to pull out of that pen. Um, there are some tricks that you can do. Um, there might be some special tools that are available. I know you can get like nib puller pliers and stuff like that from, you know, some of the nib repair guys that sell the equipment and stuff. That stuff tends to be a little expensive for just kind of the everyday person. So some things that, um, some tools that you might have handy that really help, um, a rubber band, you know, just something rubber that you can kind of wrap around the nib and feed and pull. You never want to pull on the tip of the nib to, it's, you know, you might twist the tines out of alignment or something like that. And you never want to like really squeeze too hard on the wings of the nib either. You have to be really careful. So what I'm doing when I'm dealing with a pen, um, this is a Lamy, so it's probably a bad example, but it's the pen that I have handy. So if you're trying to pull out the nib and feed, I don't do it from the side, so I'm squeezing the wings of the nib. I always do it so I have one thumb on the bottom of the feed and one thumb, my thumb on the bottom of the feed and then the, my other finger on the top. And then I kind of like rock it back and forth a little bit as I'm pulling it out. And you know, I don't try to do it with Lamy's because those feeds are tough to get back in right. But um, on other pens that you're trying to pull them out, that's one way to help. So if you want to get a little extra grip, you can use a rubber band that might help. A rubber glove maybe would help. Or if you have some other rubber material, this is actually, I'll go ahead and say my little secret here. We're working on um, cutting up these little strips of rubber. We've been doing some research, trying to find the right type of rubber, the right size and so on. But I think this is a product that we're gonna start offering here at Goulet soon, um, which is essentially a one by three strip of this um, special black rubber material that you can use to actually wrap around your nib and feed to pull it out. Um, I've used it so far on pens like the Pilot Falcon, the, a lot of the Monteverde pens can be kind of tough to get the nib and feed out of there. Um, Kuwaiko can be tough. So this thing makes that job a lot easier. So in the next couple of weeks, this is something that we'll have available at Goulet and it will help a lot. But if you don't have something like this, um, you can use like a piece of bicycle inner tube or um, maybe an old piece of garden hose or something like that would be an adequate substitute. Um, plumbing gasket material can also work. Um, so that's something to look into, but um, you're not alone in that. And there's definitely some pens that I've, I've done like the Platinum Cool I know is one that I know the nib and feed comes out, but it's really tough. That's where a little extra gripping power can make a huge difference. All right, Patrick D on Facebook, what pen brand would you carry that you don't today? Oh, that's a good question, Patrick. That's a really good question. Um, and it's hard for me to say because um, you know, there's a lot of things that we're interested in and, and sometimes as far as like stuff that we carry regularly, it's, um, there can be some, uh, you know, reasons besides what would seem obvious as to why we don't carry them. You know, sometimes there's 
there's um, brands like Visconti or Mont Blanc that it's like, yeah, those are really nice pens. We probably could carry them, but um, you know, they have a kind of a policy that they don't sell to online only stores. You know, it's just the way that they want to represent things. So we get questioned a lot about them, but we literally, we've made contact with both of those companies and they say, no, we're not interested in, in you carrying our stuff. And it's like, okay, <laughs> that's the route we want to go. You know, they just want to be brick and mortar. They're into like jewelry stores and that kind of thing. And that's, that's kind of how they view it. So they're viewing their pens, you know, kind of as jewelry as opposed to writing instruments as, as the foundational thing. So it's kind of a shame. Maybe they'll come around. I mean, I would be open to, I think Visconti would be easier to, to convince than Mont Blanc. It seems like Mont Blanc is kind of like the standard for not wanting to be sold directly online, but you know, we'll see. Um, uh, Faber Castell is another one that I've looked into. Um, you know, they've got some interesting stuff and um, you know, they've got pens that, that really vary in price range a lot. Things that are in like the $50, $60 range all the way up into the hundreds. Um, really cool stuff. They got a lot of wood pens too, which kind of, I've always, they've been on my radar ever since we started this company because of the wood pens. That's how I started out in this pen business was turning my own wood pens. Um, so they've kind of always been on my radar. We've never really just made contact with them. Haven't had a ton of people asking about them, but you know, they're, they're one that I would, would consider. Um, other ones we have considered, some of them I've talked about, like Nemesign, we talked about them in, in a couple of weeks past. Um, Sailor is one I get questioned a lot about. Um, I've talked about Sailor more recently, uh, more often recently here in Q&A. We used to carry them, but they dropped us, so um, we won't be carrying Sailor anytime soon. Um, and then there's other things like lesser known brands like Acme, Giuliano Mazzoli, uh, Diplomat, other things like that that have kind of been on my radar, but just have never really had a lot of customer demand for them. So for me, it's, you know, getting into pens and carrying like a line of pens is, is rather expensive as far as setting up the inventory. And it's a huge commitment of time and effort to photograph them all, write product descriptions for everything. We do Nib Nook, we do Pen Plaza. There's a lot that we do here when we carry a new model. So we were very t intentional about how we do that. So if you are interested in anything in particular, we'd love to know. Um, if you notice on, on Facebook, Instagram, we just recently posted some pictures of um, some Waterman pens that we've found, the Waterman Kareen and some other things that we are looking into. It's not like a guaranteed thing because they're a little more expensive pens. So we're kind of feeling out if there will be demand for them. Um, I think that there might be. So we may get into some Waterman pens like the Kareen is the one that seems that has the most interest. Um, but you know, kind of the way that we've always been with our company is very organic. So if there is a demand for something and you want us to carry something, we will seriously look into it. Usually what, the way it goes is, you know, you'll ask us for something. It'll get on our radar. We'll do our research. If we like what we see and we make contact with the manufacturer or the distributor, and there, it seems like there's a good relationship there, we'll buy a few just to test ourselves. We'll try them out right with them, make sure that we think that they hold up and that they would do well. If we like them and we pass, you know, a lot of people in our office will try them out. If we like them and we think that they will be successful, that's the point when we would order them and start to carry them. And usually we'll carry them in low quantity first. We might start with a model or two. We'll kind of dip our toes in the water. We don't just blast it out because, you know, we don't, we don't run our business on debt. We don't do any of that. So it's a very organic approach that we have towards our growth. That's how we've always been. So we're not going to just like go draw a credit line and start carrying just a shotgun approach, you know, carry all these products, see what sells, drop what doesn't and move on. That's not really how we do things. We try to be very intentional about the way we carry things. So, you know, there's a lot of things on our radar, but, you know, it's to the point where there's a lot, there's a lot more pens, you know, as far as ink goes, there's not a lot of ink that's out there that we don't carry, except for like Mont Blanc and Visconti and stuff that we know we won't be able to get, um, Sailor, you know, but uh, uh, for as far as pens go, there's a lot of models of pens that just aren't talked about quite as much um, that uh, we just haven't had a lot of people asking us about, so we haven't considered them, but um, you know, it would be something we'd certainly be open to if there's demand. All right, Nicole B on Facebook. I'm trying to get my friend interested in fountain pens, but she's used to gel pens and I've had a hard time finding the right one for her. Can you recommend a pen and ink combination that would float across the page but won't break the bank? Oh man, floating across, okay. Well, first of all, whatever pen you're using, even if it's a cheapo, if it is scratchy or anything, or if it's just not, not even scratchy, but it just isn't super smooth, 
check out the videos I have on, on the micro mesh and the mylar paper nib smoothing. Um, that can take a cheap pen and make it feel really good. Because the thing is with most fountain pens is um, they're going to have, most of them are going to have some kind of tipping material on the, on the end of the nib. And that's really what determines how the pen feels on the page. So if you can do a little bit of work to align and smooth and hone that tip yourself, you can take the cheapest of pens and make them feel really good. Um, so anyway, but if you're looking for a friend, I mean, that, that level of smoothing and stuff might be a little much for someone who's new. It may be something that if you're more experienced, you can kind of tune your friend's pen before you give it to them, that might be an option. Um, but uh, you know, if you're looking for just a great pen, kind of right out the box. Um, honestly, one of the best pens for starters is Pilot Varsity. It's a disposable pen, $3. It comes pre-inked. Um, and it feels really good. It's a great introduction into fountain pens because your friend won't have to worry about filling it and doing any of that messy kind of stuff. That seems to be what scares most people about fountain pens is like, oh, I have to ink it up myself? How? I don't even know how to do that, you know? But if you use the Varsity, it's already pre-inked. You don't have to worry about it. And it writes really smooth. It actually is a really good feeling nib, especially for three bucks. Um, so it's a really good introduction so, so that they can say like, wow, this fountain pen is really smooth. It flows really well. Gee, I didn't know that you didn't have to scribble a ballpoint for 10 minutes to get it to write. You know, it's like, I didn't know that a pen could write this smooth. So that's a great introduction. Um, another one, I've talked about this a lot, but I love it, is a Pilot Metropolitan. It's just such a great pen for 15 bucks. I mean, you just really can't go wrong. You can use it with cartridges, so that might be a good way to get your friend into it. A little lower maintenance than doing the whole inking up thing. But it comes with a converter, so if you have a bottle of ink or you want to get them a bottle, they can get started fairly easily with the Metropolitan. Lamy pens have a really solid reputation too, like the Safari and All Star. Those are really popular intro level pens, and they have, um, I'm not gonna say like the absolute smoothest of nibs, but they're pretty darn good. And you can, you know, smooth and hone those if you want to. Um, you know, you're asking about uh, ink to use as well. Ink is tough, you know, you have to get a color that they're gonna like. So that's really probably the most important thing because if they're new to fountain pens, they're not really going to notice the differences that you would have, the subtleties of from one ink to another necessarily. So as long as you're going with something that is fairly reputable, I would say that if, um, if someone is just getting into fountain pens, and it, especially if they're in the U.S., they're gonna to tend to be drawn more towards the highly saturated ink colors. So most of the Noodlers, Private Reserve, a lot of the diamine colors can be more saturated. If you go with the inks that are made by pen maker, pen companies like, you know, Lamy and Schaefer and Waterman and stuff like that, you know, some of them are really good, some of them are a little weaker, and it may, it may not seem like the pen is writing properly to new people. It's amazing when you have like highly shading inks, sometimes I get people that, that write me and think, oh my gosh, like what's wrong with my pen? I'm getting this, you know, the, pen, the color is not consistent in the ink. And I'm like, well, that's shading and that's awesome. And that's something that you can only get in a fountain pen. That's actually a really good thing. Uh, so, you know, but it takes a little bit of education there. But I think the more the color pops, the, the more appealing it is to new people. So that's, uh, that's one thing to consider there as far as ink goes. But finding a color that you know they're going to like is going to be key. All right, Mikasan on two on YouTube. Uh, hi, Brian. I was wondering why many fountain pen aficionados prefer resin over metal. I know one argument is that metal sections are a bit slippery or cold to the touch when compared to resin. Yep. But I think the durability and weight of metal pens are desirable traits to many that make up for these. Despite this, they seem much more popular with the corporate crowd than with hardcore fountain pen users. Of course, as is the case with most things, it has a lot to do with personal preference, but is there an alternative explanation you can offer? Yeah, this is a, this is a good point because this is one of the things that when I first got into the fountain pen world, I didn't understand at all. In fact, when I was making pens, I was making pen, making rollerball pens for the corporate gift crowd. So I was making, I think I've shown it before, but um, let me see, I know I have one handy. But like, here's a couple examples of some of the pens that I was making personally um, back in my wood pen making days. So here's one, it's a wood body and it's got, it's got some, you know, metal parts, it's got a metal grip. It's a pretty heavy pen. Um, and this is the smaller version. And then here's this one. I mean, this thing is gargantuan. I've got big hands, so it's hard to tell, but it's massive. Um, really cool looking, but um, you know, very kind of gaudy, 
very, very heavy. This one doesn't even post, um, but uh, very back weighted as well. The weight's all, all crazy. I didn't understand why fountain pen people liked resin pens and liked lighter pens and things like that over these bigger, heavier pens when I first got into the fountain pen thing. Um, I quickly found out why because when I was making these pens, I started carrying paper and ink to try to get people to notice my pens and then I thought I would be this master pen craftsman making these pens for the fountain pen community. Did not work out that way because of this very issue. The weight, the metalness of the pens is not as appealing to the hardcore fountain pen writers as they are to, you know, people that you write, like are kind of in like the corporate, you know, using a pen at work kind of crowd, um, particularly those who are, are familiar, more familiar with rollerballs. Um, generally, the corporate crowd likes these heavier pens because they're not writing with them for long periods of time at once. They're picking it up. There is certainly an appeal to a heavy pen as far as quality. I think generally speaking to those who first get into pens, they think the heavier the pen, the better the quality. Because you're coming over from, you know, a pen like a G2. You know, that's a, it's a nice pen, but it's a couple dollars pen. And it's really light and plastic and, you know, the build quality is okay, but it's not anything fancy. Or you get like the Bic sticks or the, the ballpoint pens and, you know, there's just nothing impressive about those. So when you get into the more expensive pens, they get a little flashier. You're getting into metal away from this kind of injection molded plastic. So metal seems better quality. It's shinier, so it's more impressive just in that way. And the weight, the weight translates to quality for, for a lot of people who would first get into it. The thing that you'll find though is when you really start to use fountain pens ongoing, like regularly, is the weight itself can be a little bit of a hindrance. You know, it's heavier in the hand. It can cause you to get fatigued as you're writing for long periods. Also, when you're carrying the same pen around with you everywhere. You know, if you're used to using these little disposable things, you're not gonna like grab onto this pen and carry it with you like it's life and death. You know, it, you're gonna be like right with it and you'll have them some just laying around and you're just kind of searching like it doesn't matter, you just pick up a pen and you don't really worry about it. When you get a nicer pen and you start carrying it around with you everywhere, if you're carrying this big heavy pen in your pocket, it's gonna weigh down, it's gonna be more likely to kind of fall out of your pocket if you're leaning over because of the weight and stuff like that. So it's not necessarily as desirable to have this big heavy pen when it's your kind of daily carry around pen. Especially if you get into carrying like three, four, five, six pens with you everywhere you go, it can add up, it can add up to the weight. Um, but then when you get into the metal grip as well, um, you're right, I think you already pretty much pointed it out. It can get a little bit slippery. It can also cause your hand to cramp with this metal grip because as you're writing, especially for longer periods, it can kind of get your, the oil in your fingers can get it to slip a little bit. And so you have to kind of grip the pen heavier to keep it in the right place. And especially because when you're writing with a rollerball pen, you can write with it and it doesn't matter the pen rotation in your hand. It's gonna write the same. But with a fountain pen, you have to have it in the proper orientation. So you have to have kind of a firmer grip on these pens when you're, you're dealing with a rotation thing if you have a slippery grip. If you have a grip that's not as slippery, it's not as much of an issue. But when you have in your pen, your hand's kind of slipping, you gotta grip it tighter and it can cause your hand to cramp up. That's why people don't like those metal grips as much for if you're writing with a long period of time. Um, I think I covered about everything that I had in my notes here. But uh, yeah, that's about it. So I would say if you're writing for like five to 10 minutes or more at a time, that's when it starts to, to become a little bit cumbersome. <clears throat> All right, I got an anonymous question from Facebook. I have the four Pilot parallel pens that I play with and I have had them for about a month, but I don't go through ink very fast. I want to flush them out, but I still have half the cartridge left. Is there any way to save the cartridge for a flushing of the pen then reinsert the cartridge? Or should I toss the cartridge and insert a new one each flushing and cleaning? Or should I just finish the cartridge even if it postpones the flushing and cleaning another few weeks? That's a great question. And I don't think this question is, has to be specific to the Pilot Parallel. I think that this could be for any pen, really, that you're dealing with. Um, the Parallel, uh, yeah, I could see where you would use that one not quite as frequently, because for those of you not familiar with the Parallel, they are essentially italic pens um, that have a 1.5, you know, 2.3, 3.8, and, oh gosh, I can't remember, 3.8 and then 6.0, I think. Um, so they're really, really, 
fat italic nibs that you just aren't going to use in everyday writing. So it's really only when you're doing like calligraphy or fancy like drawing design kind of stuff that you will actually be using those pens on a regular basis. So I can totally see why with those pens you'd be less likely to go through a whole cartridge in a quick time. Especially with all four of them, you've got, you know, you're, that's that's even less that you're using each of those pens. Um, so let's see here. You said, I'm going to jump to your last question first. You said, should I just finish the cartridge even if it postpones the flushing and cleaning another few weeks? I, you know, I always say two to four weeks, you know, really every four weeks probably. It depends on your climate, you know, it depends on the pen. If you have a pen that doesn't seal that well and you're in a really dry climate, you may have to clean your pen more often because the water is going to evaporate out of the ink quicker. If you've got a pen that seals really well and you're in a wetter climate, you're going to be able to go a lot longer, all else equal. Um, it depends on the usage and all these other things, the ink type you're using. So there's a lot of different factors. So I have to really generalize when I give my advice of like two to four weeks, something like that um, in between cleanings. But of course, you can you you be the judge of your own pens. Um, I absolutely do not stick to my own rule of cleaning it every two to four weeks. You know, I have left ink in pens for months at a time, and usually I end up having to do a really thorough cleaning afterwards. I'm not as judicious about cleaning my pens as I probably should be, uh, but you know that's okay. That's how it goes. Um, so. I would say, you know, definitely be your own judge. If you feel like the pen is still writing really well, you pick it up, it starts fine, the color's good and all that, you don't need to clean it out just because it's been that period of time. That's a general guideline that I give. Um, if the pen is starting to write a little drier, you notice that the nib is kind of crusting up a little bit, that's when you definitely need to clean it out. Otherwise, you're gonna start having some issues. Um, so I would, I would kind of use that as a gauge. Um, but specifically asking about can you save and then reinsert a cartridge. I have been asked before about if you have a cartridge and you want to switch to a different color or something, can you like save half a cartridge for later? You're not really going to be able to do that easily because um, if you're actually like saving it apart from the pen because once you've punctured that cartridge, it, that thing is open. And the thing is, these are all water-based inks. And if you just leave it sitting out, the water is going to evaporate out of that ink and you're going to be left with a more concentrated dye. And that dye does not flow as well without the water. Now, technically, you can reconstitute it with some distilled water if you really want to. But even still, then you're storing this half-opened ink cartridge that you could knock over or spill or whatever. It's just it's not very practical to do that. So storing cartridges apart from the pen for long periods is not really going to be feasible. But if you are using um, a cartridge and you want to clean out the pen and then just put the cartridge back in, um, yeah, I don't see why you can't do that unless it's like the thing is really crusted up. You know, the thing you have to realize is that if water is evaporated out of that cartridge, uh, out of the ink in that cartridge, you could be left with a more concentrated version of that ink. And so it may not flow quite as well. You'll have to be the judge, but you know, you could always try it. You can clean out the pen, put the cartridge back in, see how it writes. If it doesn't write that great, then just toss the cartridge and get a new one. Or you can reconstitute it with a little bit of water. But generally speaking, the cartridges are inexpensive enough where it's probably not worth a great deal of hassle, but you have to be your own judge in that respect. All right, Stephen B on Facebook, two-parter. Uh, what is the single best selling item at Goulet? Okay, I'll answer that one first before I do the next question. Um, that's a really interesting question, and I'm sure a lot of you are probably curious as to what that is. Um, now I'm gonna say like, I, I'm going off of what I have known from the past. I didn't like go and like pull all the numbers of big report and everything to give you like the official thing as of right at this moment. But I want to say with fairly good certainty that like the number one, we have about 3000 SKUs or so here at Goulet. That's a lot of different products. Um, the number one thing I think is, it's probably going to seem kind of anticlimactic, but um, probably the Lamy Z24 converter would be the number one. And you're kind of like, really, a converter? Um, but I think it's because you know the Lamy Safari and the All Star are very popular pens, but they don't come with a converter. So a lot of people add on converters when they buy the pens. So because you've got so many different colors, several different models that use that Z24, these using the Vista as well, the Joy, so uh, the ABC, you know, a lot of different Lamy pens. So whenever anybody's buying one of those pens, they're almost always buying a converter. So all else equal, you know, we sell a lot of bottles of ink, a lot of pens, things like that, but that converter, because it's a relatively low price and it's an add-on to a lot of different pens, that one ends up being pretty much the top. 
Um, also, the um, Pilot Con 50 is up there too. Now that pen, uh, that converter, actually comes on a lot of the Pilot pens. Uh, but even still, it doesn't come on the Metropolitan, and the Metropolitan's a very popular pen. Um, I would say, you know, if I had to categorize, like, which pens are most popular, that would be tough, because, like, pens like the Preppy and the Metropolitan, those are very popular. L you know, basically, the lower the price, the more popular something is going to be. Uh, but when you have an add-on kind of um, accessory type thing that, that really enhances it, that would... That would um, would be up there as far as popularity, bestseller kind of thing. Um, and then the next question you had was, since you all get to play hands-on with everything as it comes in, is there any item you carry which you feel should sell better? Something under the radar maybe that you think deserves more attention than it gets. Not necessarily about the numbers, I'm just sure you don't move a ton of M1000s, but that doesn't mean they don't already get plenty of attention. All right, good point, good point. Um, yeah. Um, there's definitely some things that I feel probably could get more attention than they do. Generally speaking, though, I would say that probably most of the stuff I'm not super surprised. You know, there's definitely some products that I think should be more popular than they are, but because of the price that they sell for or because of various other reasons, I'm not surprised that they don't sell well, or you know, maybe the pen is really nice, but the box is terrible, or so, you know, something along those lines. There might be factors to it where I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I can definitely see why. Like, um, you know, the the it, there's there's few things that really surprise me. Um, a couple of things that I did think through though, um, the Platinum 3776 line of pens in general, they've gained some popularity recently. I think expanding their nib offering, going to the ultra extra fine, since they've come out with the the uh, Bourgogne and the Chartres Blue, those, that's helped a lot. Um, but that, but even still, the 3776 is not as widely talked about as I feel that it probably could be. Um, I haven't really helped with that, honestly. I've done very few videos on the 3776. It just kind of ends up flying under the radar of most people. But it's a, it's a fantastic pen. Um, so that's one. Um, Stillman and Burn sketchbooks. You know, I think it's because we have we have an art following here a little bit at Goulet, but we're definitely not like an art supplier. So that that's one product that kind of crosses over between fountain pen people and mixed media artists and sketch artists and things like that. So I think that's probably the reason why it's not as popular as it could be. Um, so that's that's one thing. It's it's a great product that. Uh, a lot of people really enjoy, but it's just not on most people's radar, or maybe they don't understand it. But um, and then a couple of other pens, the Lamy CP1 and the Logo. You know, I did a I did a quick look on the CP1 a couple of weeks ago. That has helped to get on a lot of people's radar. I actually um, just posted a quick look on the Logo yesterday, which sounds weird for me to say that because I haven't actually in real time I haven't yet posted that. But once this video is posted on Friday. I will have already posted the Lamy logo quick look that I will actually be posting later today. It's weird. I'm in like an alternate dimension of time right now, but I'm here on Thursday morning recording the Q&A, and then I'm going to be posting it Friday morning, but I've got the quick look for the logo coming out later today, so it's, it's interesting. But anyway, quick look for the logo. The Lamy CP1 and the logo are two Lamy pens that just get completely overlooked because of some of the popularity of the Safari and the All-Star and stuff. So those are a couple other ones that are worth a look. <clears throat> Mike on Ink Nouveau, would you consider having some nibs like your Goulet nibs or Edison's, Twisby's, etc., pre-ground by nibmeisters and then keep them in stock? the way Franklin Kristoff does with Mike Masayama nibs, or have an option where one can add stub grind or something to his cart and then take care of it for the customer through a nibmeister along with a warning that you are voluntarily giving up your warranty and that you may delay shipment by two to three weeks or whatever the wait time may be. I think it would be a great service that many people would love to take advantage of. I know that you have to keep good relations with your distributors, but Bender, Modishaw, and Pendleton are all authorized retailers of pens like Pilot, Platinum, Pelican, etc. So I think at least some companies must be okay with it. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've talked with some of the manufacturers that we have, like you know Pelican and some of the other ones, who I know that some of the nibmeisters out there, like Bender and, and Modishaw and all of them, um, retail their stuff. And I've talked to them like, you know, how are they doing warranty stuff? So um, how does that actually work when you're doing nib grinding and stuff? Well, it's, it's nothing magical. I mean, um, if you're grinding a nib or tweaking it or doing anything to it, basically, from 
the time that it's you know manufactured, distributed, or whatever before it gets to you as a customer, you're voiding that warranty on behalf of the customer. So, as you. So if I get a pen and I'm doing anything to it or have it ground or have it done anything, I'm voiding the warranty for that nib and feed and all that. Um, not necessarily for the rest of the pen. So if there's an issue with the cap, the way that snaps on, or if it's you know there's some flaw in the manufacturing in some other way, that would still be covered under warranty by the manufacturer. But anything on the nib, if that nib is tweaked or adjusted at all, you're, you're voiding the warranty. So guys like Binder, Monishaw, and all of them, they are um, basically self-warrantying their nib work which makes sense because they're nib guys. So, you know, if there's a problem with your nib and you send it back to them, they'll fix it, they send it back to you. That's the way that they do it. Um, so, you you know, if you buy a pen from one of them and then they're not around anymore or something like that, or they, you know, whatever, whatever happens, you aren't able to send it to them. If you try to send it to the manufacturer, they're not gonna, they're not gonna touch that nib because it's been altered. So it's like hands off at that point. So um, that complicates things a little bit as far as warranties go. Um, you know, Franklin Kristoff, I don't really know much about how they do things, um, but they're, you know, they're manufacturing their own pens. So they can do whatever they want. They're already warrantying their own stuff anyway. And I believe that geographically, they're pretty close to Mike Masayama. I believe. I don't know exactly where Franklin Kristoff is. I think Mike Masayama is in Georgia, maybe the Atlanta area. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, I've heard good things about Mike, by the way. Never done any really direct work with him, but seems like he has a good reputation. Um, so that's probably why, you know, they must be sending nibs to him in bulk. He's doing some tweaking stuff and then getting it to them and, and they're warrantying it. Um, you know, if there's an issue, I'm sure they can deal with him directly. It's a little bit tougher for us because we don't have, we're geographically not close to any nib guys. So Bender is up in New Hampshire, I think. Um, Modishaw, I don't know where he is. I believe he's out there on the West Coast somewhere. Forgive me if I'm wrong. I think he's out on the West Coast. Um, Pendleton, you mentioned, I think he's in California. Uh, Mike Masayama's down in Georgia. So there's there's really not a lot of other nib guys either. So it's, um, it's tough because um, geographically we're far away. So if we were to, I guess if we were to get nibs in bulk, like done up and then we were to sell them as like nibs ground by so-and-so, that would be logistically kind of the only possible way that I could see it happening. Um, you you mentioned having it ground kind of after the pen is purchased. So I'm assuming it would be like you buy a pen from us and then we send it to one of these nib guys and then they send it to you. That gets a, to be a logistical nightmare. Um, first off, because we would have to have a markup of some kind. To go through all that logistical hoopla, you've got extra shipping costs and everything, we would have to be marking it up just to cover those costs. Not to mention we would need to actually make something off the, the deal at the end of the day in order to have it even be worthwhile, you know, from a business standpoint. Um, so you would end up paying kind of a lot, you know, because you'd be paying for the work that the actual Nibmeister is doing, and then you would be paying for kind of all this extra logistical stuff to be taken care of for you, as opposed to like you buy the pen, you get it in, and then you send it to the Nibmeister yourself and, and get it back. Um, so maybe in the end it wouldn't be that different of a price, but that would really depend on what we would negotiate with each of the Nibmeisters. But that kind of brings up a bigger issue of we don't really have a lot of Nibmeisters around and none of them are really starving for work. Most of them have a backlog of at least a month, maybe more. So, <laughs> you know, I guess if we worked out some kind of special arrangement or something, we might be able to get it faster. But none of them are really starving for work, so it's gonna be hard to really hardball negotiate anything, you know, because they really just don't need the work. You know, they're so stinking busy as it is, and there's so few people that are actually out there doing the nib stuff that it's gonna be hard to really make that logistically something that would be of benefit all around. Um, this is the devils in the details kind of situation. Um, now I know the next question you're gonna be thinking is like, why don't you learn how to grind your own nibs and all that kind of stuff? Well, that's great in theory, and, Actually, Drew and I both just signed up for uh, Bender's workshop. We're going to be at the DC show um, in in August uh, next month here. So we signed up for his little workshop. So we're going to do some nib smoothing stuff. We've we've worked with Brian Gray before from Edison. He's he's taught us some stuff over video um, about how to do some just light nib tuning and stuff. No like regrinding or flow adjustment necessarily. Um, it's not not probably something we're going to be able to logistically offer here anytime soon. 
the hardest part of that is the amount of time that it takes to get trained and really good at that is something that is just going to be really hard for us to invest, um, especially because most of the people that are doing it are just independent people that do sh the show circuit and they do kind of their own nib grinding. They just make it kind of a part of their living. and It's, it's really a lifestyle thing. To have like an in-house nib grinder here and keep them employed and not you know, spend years training them to have them like go off and just do their own thing. That's going to be really tough from a business standpoint to, to build that up. So in, in theory, it seems like a great idea, but any exploring anything along this avenue, I would have to say I would be cautiously pessimistic about it actually working out logistically. I hate to say that, but I'm just, I'm such a realistic guy and I've, I've done some of this nib tuning stuff myself, just getting into it and it's just not easy. It's, I mean, there's, there's some of the basic, basic stuff is very easy, but when you get into grinding and flow adjustment and stuff, you really need to know what you're doing and it varies a lot pen to pen and it just takes a lot of experience to get really good at it. So it's tough. It's tough, but you know, it's it's not something I'm completely closed off to, but it's definitely not as straightforward as it would probably seem. All right, I'm doing pretty good on time here, but I'm gonna have to wrap up in about 10 minutes. So I have my alarm set that'll go off here. So just give me a second. Ooh, gotta refresh. Mm. Coffee. All right, <clears throat> Tom S on Ink Nouveau. I have an odd question. I am already budgeting to get a Metal Falcon. I love my standard soft fine falcon but i want a con 70 sized falcon my question is does anyone know if the sections or nibs are swappable between the two models as that will help me decide if i should get the sef soft extra fine on the metal or stay with the nib that works i'm a left-hander and nibs are often either very nice to me or the worst thing ever i'm constantly shocked by the number of people that assume the nibs i i actually favor won't work for me so, man, when you say lefty, it's like, especially a lefty with a soft nib like this, it could be great, it could be a nightmare, you know? And I, because of, of the softness of the nib and the variation that people can have in the way they write left-handed, I've seen some left-handed folks that can use just about any pen. Uh, you know, Katie Campbell, who used to be customer care here at Goulet, um, she was left-handed and could write with just about anything because her her hand was uh, kind of a mirror image of right-handed, you know? So she had the proper like 45 degree thing and it wasn't a big deal. Other people that are hook-handed and, you know, kind of more like level-handed along with the writing and stuff, they struggle more with soft nibs because of the angle that you're writing and you're going in the strong push motion with that nib. And when you, when you have that softness and the tines kind of spread out a little bit, it can really dig in and cause you some problems. So you know yourself pretty well, but in general, I tend to not recommend these nibs for left-handed folks unless they have had some experience with them and know that they like them, especially a pen that's as expensive as a Metal Falcon. Um, so the, yeah, the nib on the Metal Falcon is the same one as the Pilot Falcon. So yes, you can swap those nibs. They're not easy to do. That's part of why I'm gonna be offering this rubber thing pretty soon is the you can pull those nibs out of there. It's really tough though, because the Falcon's got this feed that kind of like swoops in and there's no fins or anything. It's kind of tough to grab onto. Um, that's where this thing can help tremendously. So you can swap those nibs out. You can actually buy replacement nib sections. Um, we can special order them. We don't stock them, um, but they're, they're kind of expensive. They're about half the price of the pen itself. Um, not quite half the price of the metal one because the metal one you're mainly paying for the body. But if you wanted to get a metal falcon and like swap the nibs between the two, you, you can do that. Um, but uh, you know, you can also, if you just want the soft extra fine, you can get that in the Pilot Falcon. Not the Namiki one, not the gold one yet. We're, we're questioning them about why can't you get the, the soft extra fine in the gold Namiki Falcon in the gold trim one. Why is it only in the, the rhodium? you know, trim that you can get the soft extra fine. Cause that's like, it seems crazy to me because it's like, it's a still a gold nib on both pens, but the rhodium plated one is literally a yellow gold plated with rhodium. So it's like that nib is gold right there at some point in that process. All you need to do is like not plate it and then put it on the other pen. I don't know, it's crazy, um, but I'm not a manufacturer. So I don't know what's all involved with that. So, but I am encouraging them like, if you can get the gold soft extra fine on the Miki Falcon, please do, cause that would be great. Um, but I will say though, okay, so you're looking at the soft extra fine versus the soft fine. There is a mark, marked difference between the smoothness of the soft fine and the soft extra fine. The soft extra fine is noticeably scratchier. 
Um, not necessarily like cutting the paper scratchy, but toothier, yeah, all that stuff. And in a push motion with lefty, oh boy, I would say, yeah, I would be a little bit hesitant to say like, oh, you're gonna absolutely love that pen, especially if you're buying a Metal Falcon with a soft extra fine, it's a little bit of a gamble. Now, of course, you can always give it a shot. Um, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a gamble. So, um, you know, it's not, it's, it's going to take some thought to think about whether that's going to be the right move or not. But um, it is a cool nib, though. I will say that. So, all right, Christopher N. on Ink Nouveau. Have you looked into carrying any products by Stedler? They have a good selection of products ranging from drafting tools to some nice fountain pens. Um, no, I've never considered carrying them. You're the first person I've ever had ask me in nearly five years to carry that brand, honestly. I had to look them up, because I was like, Stedler, that sounds familiar. I was like, aren't they like office products and stuff? So I looked, and they're mainly like pencils and, and um, you know, mechanical pencils and drafting pencils and stuff like that, ballpoints. I saw, a, I looked on their site, I saw a couple of fountain pen, like calligraphy fountain pen sets that are around $20, you know, kind of like those Schaefer calligraphy sets that are just not that great quality. Um, you know, not the Stedler one. I don't know anything about the Stedler ones. The Schaefer ones, I've heard mixed things. Um, I, don't, I don't carry those, um, but you know, they're kind of just these cheapy generic things that you can get at like office supply stores. Um, but no, I haven't, you know, I haven't, uh, I haven't anybody asked me about Stedler. So given the fact that they, the pens that they seem to have are kind of in this, this range of like the Lamy ABC and the Pelican Pelicano and, and those kind of starter pens that I've never really had good success carrying in the past. Uh, I don't think, and given the fact that most of their brand is not fountain pens, I would say it's probably not anything I'm gonna carry anytime soon. All right, so Christopher had another question. Second, if you and your family were to dress up as fountain pens for Halloween, what pens would you guys dress uh, as and why? Oh uh, gosh, um, that's an interesting question. I've never been asked that one. Um, well, first of all, we wouldn't dress up because we don't really do Halloween um, for our own reasons, but um, not really our thing. But I guess if we were to do Halloween, um, it seems to me that the, the pens that would give you the most Halloween feel or the most opportunity to dress up in a cool costume would probably be number one, like the Noodler's Nib Creeper. I mean, come on. It's like Halloween, Nib Creeper, Grim Reaper, come on. Um, the Ahab, the Conrad, all of those could be really fun in a costume. Um, so that, that was, would have to be my answer. Also, like maybe the Pilot Falcon, you could have like a, you know, kind of incorporate a bird thing into it. I don't know. I don't know. Um, okay. And then you also asked, uh, when will the Twisby 580 USA arrive? Um, that's going to be coming at the end of August. It's already been pushed back a little bit. They were shooting for 4th of July, did not happen. Shooting for late July, did not happen. It's now late August. Keep an eye on the product page for the Twisby 580 USA on gulepens.com for any updates. We do have um, the most updated information that we have as to the delivery date on that page. William S. on Facebook. Hee <laughs> hee, what paper is best if you're writing with an invisible ink? Well, I think it seems like you're asking a silly question or trying to, but there's actually a legitimate answer to your question. So there's a couple of different invisible inks out there. Um, Noodler's Whiteness of the Whale, that's really more of a mixing ink. It's kind of a white ink, but when you're putting it on white paper, it's basically invisible. It is UV reactive though. Um, and then the, the number one invisible ink though is Noodler's Blue Ghost. It is truly an invisible ink. You rewrite it and you can't tell what the heck you're writing. Um, you need to be using a UV light, a black light, uh, to be able to read it. Um, so the specific type, like brand of paper doesn't matter so much, but the color of the paper matters a lot. If you're using white paper, it's actually not gonna work quite as well because the UV reaction, it's gonna react to the white in the paper um, as well as the ink. So you'll still be able to read it, but it's actually gonna appear much more drastic if you're using an off-white paper or some other color paper, like a blue or, you know, if you've got a correspondence paper that's anything other than white, the darker the better, that invisible ink is really gonna pop a lot more when you're using it with that UV light. So I think you thought you were being funny, which you kind of are, but there's a legitimate answer there, so use off-white paper. Chad V on Facebook, so what does make the Aztec an awesome color? <laughs> You're probably asking me in the wrong week because my Aztec is currently in the shop as we speak. Um, long story short, it's not a Aztec specific 
problem necessarily. We had some weird issue with the anti-theft module not recognizing the key and all this stuff. We had some drama back in uh, Thanksgiving of last year where the um, the the like security bar like for the ignition you know thing like got locked down and we literally couldn't turn the key in our own car. And we had to spend the night here at the shop because we were stranded. And it was a long story. All of our family was out of town. And we have two kids, so they need car seats and everything. It was just like more drama than it was worth to try to get home. So we just stayed in the office. Because at that time, my kids were, were here in our office. And we had like beds and everything set up. So it was like, all right, we'll just spend the night here. Um, so And that was ended up being some drama with a locksmith coming in and having to you know replace our ignition and all that stuff. As we were like going and visiting Rachel's parents for Thanksgiving, we were gone. I was trying to talk to this, you know, like Ukrainian locksmith who was trying to fix the stuff. It was just ridiculous. Um, so anyway, that got fixed. And now apparently there's some other issue with that ignition where the module is not, rec it just flat out just didn't recognize the thing. So we've, we're getting that replaced right now. It's way more expensive than you would think. But other than that, other than that one issue, that car has actually been fantastic. We've not had a single issue with it other than this weird ignition problem. Um, the car is, runs great. So um, there's a lot of good things about this car. And I know you're probably like, I don't care about the Aztec. Why would you even bother? So um, oh, it's 945. All right, so this will be my last question. I will go ahead and, um, and wrap up here. But um, basically, there's a lot of good reasons. First off, I mean, Breaking Bad, Walter White drives an Aztec. And that's just BA. Come on. Um, but uh, honestly, I bought the car before I knew about that show. So that's not the reason I got it. But funny enough, the price of that car has gone up dramatically since Breaking Bad came out. I'm not joking. I don't know if it's directly correlated to that, but when we bought our Aztec, it was uh, close to half the price of what they're selling for now. So I don't know, maybe I should sell it and get a decent investment once I get this ignition thing taken care of. But anyway, um, so, and, you know, it's funny, but it's um, the, the originally the reason we liked it is because it was so undervalued because it's recognized as like one of the most hideous cars ever made, whatever. I don't think that that's the case. It's not, okay, it's not like the most beautiful thing in the world, but it is so freaking functional. It's ridiculous. You know, we've got two young kids. The interior of that car is indestructible, so the kids just like take with all their nastiness, you know, they just junk up those insides of those seats and they clean up beautifully. So that's one thing. It's got an amazing turning radius. So parking that thing is a dream. I'm not joking. That's one of my favorite things about the car. And it's very comfortable. Like it's a good sitting height. It's a UV, it's a SUV. You know, so it's a good sitting height, but it drives like a car. It's very, you know, it's got got some decent pep, gets decent gas mileage. Um, it's comfortable for both me and Rachel. We are both very different sizes, you know, in terms of like length of limbs and stuff like that. So for us to both find a car, specifically my super long legs, it's, it can be tough. So that one actually drives comfortably for both of us. Um, it's all wheel drive, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it just, it fits tons of stuff inside there. It's very, that, that weird kind of back that it has may look kind of funny, but it is super functional. We can fit an amazing amount of junk in the back of that car, which comes in handy with two kids. And you can like fold up the seats and all this kind of crazy stuff. So um, I had two more questions, but unfortunately I'm not going to be able to get to them this week. I'm gonna have to go ahead and wrap it up now because I've got an interview that I've got to go join. So thank you so much for participating in this week's q and I appreciate everybody that asked questions, even if I didn't get to it, I'm so sorry. I'm a little light on videos right now, um, not getting out quite as many as I would normally like to just because we're so busy with all the growth and other things that we have going on here. I promise you though, everything that I'm doing here, I'm still working towards making your experience with my company as good as possible. A lot of that has to do with training up, other people on my team so that I can then be freed up to do more videos and stuff like that. So it's gonna ebb and flow a little bit. Right now the videos are gonna be a little bit tougher for me to get out because of the time commitments I have in other areas of the company, but Q&A is one thing I'm gonna really try to just kinda of keep on going as a bare minimum for video stuff. But that's about all I have. Next week I'm gonna do just an open forum again because I got so many questions I didn't get to. We'll ask some more. Um, so it'll be, what's that, June? No, not June, July, August 1st, wow. Gosh, it's gonna be August? Holy cow, this year's flying by. Okay, so next year, next week it'll be August 1st, 42nd episode. Have a great week. If you have any questions, you can post them on Inc. Nouveau or on YouTube in the comments. You can email GouletQA at GouletPens.com. You can hashtag GouletQA on Twitter, or you can reply on Facebook when we ask the question early next week. So I hope you have a wonderful weekend, a great rest of the week. Thanks for joining me, and right on. Here.